Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was about uh, four or five, I, I learned an extremely valuable lesson I'll never forget. Our next door neighbor had uh, presented my little sister and me gifts, two gifts, very different from one another. One gift was large, looked like it was a large box. It was nicely wrapped, had uh, gold wrapping around it, and was tied up with uh, yellow, I'm sorry, with red ribbon and bow. The other was smaller, and it too was wrapped, but it was wrapped in basically a paper bag, and uh, it was just twine that was wrapped around it to keep the bag on the smaller gift. And so I, being the oldest, was given the option to choose first, which would I want? And as they say, it was a no-brainer. I love gifts. I cook the nicer, bigger of the two. Imagine my surprise and frustration when I unwrapped and discovered that inside it was a um, coconut-covered piece of marshmallow. <laughs> the two things in this world that I hate the most. <laughs> coconut-covered anything and marshmallow. My sister, on the other hand, opened her gift, and it was a rather large, solid piece of milk chocolate. My favorite. I felt like Charlie Brown getting a rock in his Christmas stocking. And I learned that lesson. You can't tell on what's on the inside merely by the packaging on the outside. The people who followed Jesus were learning this lesson as well. Up to this point in St. Luke's Gospel, the 18th chapter, people were trying to figure out Jesus. They saw what he was doing on the outside, but they couldn't quite make out what was going on on the inside. There were all sorts of interpretations. Well, let's see. Jesus was a healer. He had healed so many people to this point. He was also a storyteller. He seemed to be incessantly telling fabulous tales called parables. He was a revolutionary. He always seemed to be picking a fight with people who were in charge. He was a teacher. He surrounded himself with 12 students, or disciples, we'll call them. Oh, and he was a wonder worker as well. I mean, he walked on water. He, he turned uh, just a few loaves of bread and fish in order to feed 5,000 people. So you understand, don't you, that the people had a hard time trying to determine just exactly who is Jesus simply by observing him on the outside. But along comes this guy. He's a guy on the side of the road. Really, nobody's special. And he's blind to boot. He is a person who is entirely dependent on the charity and welfare of others. And he calls out. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> son of David. It's interesting. It's an interesting title. Up to this point in the Gospel of Luke, nobody calls Jesus the son of David. What's this all about? Well, to begin with, David is a powerful name. It evokes the golden era for the Israelites. That particular time when David, son of Jesse, ruled the land. And he did so benevolently, but he did so with power. The Israelites, they longed for that day when things would be made right. And when the son of David would ascend to the throne and do the work that David once did. They looked forward to this day, and the prophets, they themselves, spoke of the coming of the Son of David to rule all of Israel. David never healed anybody. David wasn't a miracle worker. David didn't tell stories. David 
was with the teacher. He was a king. And as a king, he was royalty. And, and he lived in a palace. He didn't live in the streets with the common people. He had servants. He had slaves who would give him whatever he wanted. David never had to worry about where his next meal would come from. He had everything a guy would ever want. He was, after all, the king. He was different. And that's what's so odd about this blind guy and what he says. He calls Jesus son of David. And he seems to see more clearly than anyone else of who Jesus really is. He, he sees that Jesus is this coming king. The one who is ushering a new kingdom. He sees that this new kingdom is a place where blind people are welcome. And they might even be given sight. He sees that in this new kingdom, people who are on the side of the road, they're not throwaways. They really matter. He sees that in this new kingdom, people who live day after day without any hope are given hope. Everyone else. Everyone else sees on the outside Jesus, but only this blind guy really has eyesight to see who Jesus really is. He sees that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the promises of the prophets. That Jesus is the fulfillment of God's intention for making all things right. This morning, I would like to invite you to see Jesus a little differently. And in so doing, maybe to see others differently as well. I have asked Gail Johnson, one of our members, to share with us a passion that she has. Now everybody, everybody has a passion. And most people, especially at this time of the year, their passions are about getting more stuff, having more money, being more popular, having more things. This isn't Gail's desire, and I'm sure that after listening to Gail this morning, you might see her differently as well. But first, we have you watch the video screen for a very special video. of iMatter is to assist young people in being able to get off the street. My name is Yvonne Montoya, aka Paige. Um, I'm 23 years old. There was never really a connection with the family in, until my later years when I actually started doing better in life. Um, it never really seemed to fit in with my family. I, I actually was on the streets. Uh, I didn't go to school, 16 years old, 15 years old. What are you gonna do? What options do you really have? My name is Ashley Hughes. I'm from Visalia, California. And I'm working now. <laughs> when it started, I was homeless for approximately a year. I was sleeping in a park. I never thought that I wouldn't have someone I could turn to to take me into the house. I'm Jose Richard Williams and I'm 21 when I'm 22. Living on the streets for me is like, it's like Survivor. 
It's like Survivor, man. I would go seven times. Probably more than seven. I've been dead too many times. And I felt death. I've seen death. Yeah, it's not a good feeling. It's not a happy feeling. I ended up on the streets by drinking, doing drugs, and not listening to my parents. the streets uh, through complicated uh, family life. I had an you know, abusive stepfather and a neglective mother and uh, things at home would get so hard or dangerous at times I guess. It forced me out on the streets on my own or other times I would actually get thrown out on the streets. A lot of times, it, ironically, a lot of times it was safer to be on the streets Young people have told us stories about their family life that are painful to hear, yet they survive. And more than survive, many of those we spoke to are improving their lives despite their circumstances and the obstacles they face. Well, I know the program works for several different reasons. I know because I myself have been in that position and I have benefited from the services. For these kids to have an actual place to go to, it means that they have a safe place to be. It means that they have the, their basic needs met. It means that um, they have a support system. It means that they can go to a place where somebody really cares about their future and who really wants to be involved. Yvonne and the staff of I Matter helped me get into some programs that I didn't know existed and pretty much set me on the right path as far as getting into a work environment and being able to at one point actually find a job on my own. Whereas before, I was really timid and I didn't want to go out and try to work and I didn't want to do any of that. Well, I think the unique situation that um, most people that were involved in the program that I used to be involved in that helped um, homeless uh, youth also found out that, that being homeless is uh, it's sort of a complex definition. You can't really put it in a box. I mean, you. You can have a, a residence, or but as long as it's not your home, it's not you're st still homeless. Having I matter open would mean I matter. <laughs> <laughs>
And I have to say, um, when I first met her, it was extremely frustrating because I could see so much more potential in her. A lot of people could see so much more potential in her than what she actually seen herself. Once you got to know Yvonne, you found out that she was fun, she was insightful, artistic, adaptable, resourceful. She was a leader, kind, compassionate, brave, and outgoing. Um, we had a program working with homeless young people and um, Yvonne wanted to get more involved even though she herself was homeless at the time. So I asked her to lead an art class for these young people. And after she had done that for a little while, she, um, she asked if she could work there. And I told her that if she wanted to work there, she had to go back to school. So she did. She called my challenge, and she went back to school. Uh, I ended up hiring her as a peer counselor to work with other homeless young people. And then she soon after that became a case manager, and she did an excellent job. Um, today, Yvonne is the manager of a restaurant in Los Angeles. She continues to help young people around her, and she's also attending church. Um, she does, she is, continues to do a lot of healing. She's taking care of herself, and she's blessing others along the way. When I first met Rob, he was also very angry. He felt that his mother had chosen her husband over him. He was into Marxism. He was using drugs. He was not motivated. He was extremely distrustful, anti-establishment, and he suffered with depression and anxiety. He was sleeping in doorways. He was sleeping in the rooftops of downtown. He never knew where his next meal was coming from. Uh, he complained about his feet hurting all the time. He would wear the same socks for months, and him and his friends used to talk about how the socks would stick to their feet because they couldn't change them. They didn't have a place to shower. They would get kicked out of places and run off Main Street. And again, once you got to know Rob, you would find that he was very bright, he was socially conscious, he was curious, he was a leader, he was honest, caring, and loyal. Rob has accomplished a lot since the first time I met him. He graduated COS at the top of his class. He earned a full ride scholarship to a university. He since then has gotten married. Um, he still has struggles, um, but as <laughs> time goes on, he continues to meet them and he continues to grow. Today he's a Christian and he's very grateful to have God in his life. He has a relationship with his dad and his grandparents. I have to say this is a very short version of the struggles from the time I first met them to where they're at today. But basically what they really needed was people in their life who cared about their future. It's been amazing watching God work in their lives. Um, and it's actually been a lot of fun watching God work in their lives. The descriptors that we give homeless people include lost, homeless, disconnected, mental illness, developmentally delayed, no place to shower, depression, anxiety, anger, poor health, poor nutrition, poor hygiene, transportation problems, loss of belongings on a regular basis, poor coping skills, feeling of hopelessness and helplessness, rebellious, addicted to drugs, and the list goes on and on. These young people are much more than the way we often describe them. Look past the exterior and you just might find a gem that just needs a little bit of polishing. <laughs>
possibilities that exist within you that you may not fully understand. Also, chances are, there are disappointments in you as well that no one else will understand. Places that you wish to hide. But there are dreams too, aren't there? You are possessing dreams that no one else would begin to imagine. What does God look at when he looks at you? God sees the person that you really are. And God sees you as God wants you to become. And my sense of God is that, yes, he may see the imperfect in you, the part that you are ashamed of, the part that you want no one else to see, but God does not imprison you in your imperfections. God wants to liberate you, to allow you to become the person that God dreams you to be. The question that Jesus asked the blind man is a great question. Perhaps God is asking it of you as well. What do you want me to do for you? Be careful how you answer that question. Don't sell yourself short. Don't sell your soul for anything less than that is fully satisfying. Because you might just get what you want. Maybe not what you really need. But what if your answer reveals your deepest desires? That noble good, that dream, that's better for you and others around you. What if God gave you that thing which would enhance not only your life, but all of the people that you encounter as well? In each of us, there is that person. And in every person here and every person out there, there is that possibility. There is no one you will encounter who does not matter to God. And for those others might see by their packaging as throwaway or lost, you know God sees them a possibility that they can become too. And maybe, just maybe, God wants to do for them what God wants to do for you too. We sing together our hymn of the day, What Wondrous Love Is This? As we do, if you have spiritual needs cards, you may hand those into the ushers. Please rise.